Thank you. Hi, my name is Eddie Sfringeo. I uh, serving as part of your youth leadership for about 16 years now. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me tell you guys a little bit about a couple of the things that Adi was talking about because I get excited about ministry, all right? Um, and a lot of those are just uh, babies of mine and babies of, of our youth ministry. Just two things I wanted to touch on. Uh, one, the leadership retreat. That is like the coolest thing, all right? So you understand where we're at. If you know anything about uh, Lake Tahoe, we're at Zephyr Point, all right? So where that is, that's about two and a half hours from here. Uh, you drive through South Lake Tahoe, you whip up around the backside, and there's like this peninsula. This, this is the only one, this peninsula that kind of peaks into Lake Tahoe, and we're right there. So you understand, um, from cabin uh, number number four, or uh, cabin number one, for example, it's small houses that we're renting. Uh, from cabin number one, you walk out the front door, and 10 paces later, you're in the water. You understand? Like, it's on the water. It's going to be super cool, and um, we're going to have a fantastic time with that. And at 150 bucks, which covers three days, two nights, five meals, all of the guest speakers that are coming, and the entire event, that's pretty amazing, all right? So it'll, it'll be pretty cool. There's a bunch of different cabins and stuff, and they are cabins. They're not, it's not like it's a hotel, so it's a little bit more rustic, but uh, we're going to have a good time. Second thing I just wanted to mention before we get into what we're talking about tonight is Timothy Nestor Project. I am so glad that we are back together. And uh, the group that I participate in, that I'm a part of, um, we're like uh, 13 people in our last meeting and then 10 in the one before that. Um, and we're just having a good time. We're just coming together, reading through uh, this great book by Max Lucado called Traveling Light. I mean, it's just brilliant. We're having a good time. And we just kind of spend time together getting to know one another and standing together in prayer and pursuing the Lord. So, so here's the thing. Uh, when I first got saved, I don't want to go in this long thing. Okay. So when I first got saved, the way that I grew most spiritually was through sermons. That was like the number one way that I grew spiritually. It was attending church. And then at some point in time, that stopped being the number one way that I was growing spiritually because I was growing. And then I started serving in the church. And that was the number one way that God was speaking into my life and that he was teaching me things and he was growing me. And then at, as, as I was serving and serving and serving, at some point in time, I started teaching. And then that became the number one way that God was growing me. Because it's one thing to know something. It's another thing to be able to formulate it, critically analyze it, and then, and then reprocess it to be able to communicate it clearly. And that was like the number one way that God was growing me for a season. So what I'm getting at is this, is if you're growing in Christ, if you're saved, if you're, if you're a Christian, if you attend church, you should be pursuing being a disciple. If you look in scripture, uh, the word Christian is used two times. Okay, the word disciple is used over 270 times. There's a reason for that, because all Christians are called to be disciples. We could talk about this for the next hour, but I'll leave it alone. Uh, my encouragement to you is just this. You don't have to be in a discipleship group to be a disciple. But if you're somebody who's wanting to pursue the Lord, it's good to have accountability around you. It's good to, to have accountability because, you know, I got to read this chapter because I'm going to meet with my guys next week. I've, I've had so many reports of young people that have said, you know, Eddie, I've read more of the Bible. I've studied more of the Bible. I've read more spiritual books. I've re I studied more Christian books than I ever have in my entire life uh, in, in the time. Sorry, I've read more in the time that I've been in discipleship than I ever have in any other time in my life. So it's just a great place to be able to grow spiritually and to grow with other Christians who love God. So with that said, uh, let's dive into tonight's series. So what we're talking about today is a godly relationship. I know that that's why a good portion of you guys are here today, which is good. A godly relationship is such a unique topic. Um, as I travel a lot, this is the number one thing that I teach on. It's the number one thing that I get asked about. Whenever I go to youth conferences and, and uh, I'll open up the floor to Q&A, what will usually happen is the way that we do it is through Google Voice. So you can just literally text me a question and I'll get it on my iPad. And what will usually happen is I'll open up the floor to Q&A and 120, 180 questions will just come flooding in which is insane. There's no way I can answer all of them. So I answered them on a blog or something like that. Um, and that's happened multiple times because I think one of the biggest things that young people uh, have to make a decision on is this part of your life, right? What's interesting is some of the biggest decisions that you have to make in life are in the age group that you're in right now, right? I mean, think about that. Yeah, you have to decide what you're going to do with your eternal soul. Most people that choose to be a Christian choose before the age of 18. 95% of people that make a decision for Christ are before the age of 18, all right, so that's, that's a huge decision you're making. Number two, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? That's a hard decision to make at this age. You understand what I'm saying? Like, like you'll go to college, and so many people's major is undeclared, or it's declared, and then it gets changed 
from the freshman semester to the fall semester, spring semester to the fall semester, to the next one, to the next one, and it gets changed five, six, seven times over. You, you, you work halfway through a degree, and then you realize, you know what, I hate accounting, and then you switch gears, and then you start doing something else. That's a hard decision to make. And then the third one that we often have to make typically in this time in our lives is who we're going to marry and spend the rest of our lives with. No do-overs, no repeats. You're just going to make a decision for the rest of your life. That's not easy, man. That's very difficult, all right? Um, and actually, let me take my jacket off because I wore it for the Comitat meeting. Wondering where, where I was up until now, there's a board meeting happening in the back with our new administrative board, which is super exciting. And um, yeah, we can clap about that. But let me tell you something. I'm so proud of you guys, and I know that the mic's not picking me up, but you can hear me. I'm so proud of you guys because we had record turnout for voting this year. 75% of our eligible voting members voted this year. All right, that's record turnout. It was 219 people voted this year out of 292. 219, the most we ever had in any other previous year was 156, 158, something like that. And the young people made a really big presence, which makes me proud of you guys because you guys have more of a voice in the church, and I want that. So. That being said, uh, we'll just focus back in on this. What's interesting is this, is as I travel around, and, and even as growing up in the Romanian church in this church, this is the only church I've ever known my entire life, um, and as I travel around, any one of you could tell me what's not allowed. What are you not allowed to do in a relationship if you're a Christian? Don't say things out loud, because that would be inappropriate, all right? Because <laughs> everybody starts in the worst thing they can think. Anyways, so... <laughs> So it's, it's just how it is. The, um, so we could all name things that we're not allowed to do or what a bad relationship looks like or where you can cross boundaries or, or what you would think that the church would call a boundary crossing or something that you don't want, you know, something you think to yourself, boy, I sure hope Jesus doesn't show up on this, you know, those kinds of, okay. So, so um, but if I were to ask you, what does a good relationship look like? What does a good relationship look like? It's a lot harder. It takes more critical analysis. If, if, if I were to ask you to give me an example of a bad relationship that you heard about growing up, you'd be like, oh, man, I was one guy, and he was doing this and that. Or, you know, I, I heard of a guy, and he hit his uh, uh, girlfriend, and that's totally not okay. You know, we, we can come up with examples, right? Uh, but if I were to ask you of an example of a good relationship, you know what examples we give? Our ex definition of a good relationship in the church is a relationship that isn't doing anything bad. You realize that? Oh, they show up to church, and I, don't, I haven't heard any bad thing about them. So therefore, they must be a good relationship. Isn't that crazy? We have a definition of actions that define a bad relationship. But our definition of a good relationship is the absence of bad. There's a whole entire sermon in there about how we see Christianity as well, by the way. The avoidance of sin versus the pursuit of holiness. But that's a whole other message. So my desire and what I really felt God leading us towards is to talk about what a godly relationship does look like. What does a godly relationship look like? And I want to spend today as the first part of the series. Next week, I'm in North Carolina, so David's going to be teaching. That's not going to be a part of the series, but the week after that, uh, I'll be back home, and we'll teach part two. The week after that, we'll teach part three, um, and then possibly, I have no idea what's happening in the fourth week, but we may have some Q&A somewhere in there, because I like opening up the floor to Q&A, so that way you guys can ask me about specific issues. You won't have to raise your hand. It'll be anonymous. You can text me the question. It'll appear on my iPad. I don't have your numbers on my iPad. I don't have your names on my iPad, so it'll just appear. It'll be a question. I'll read it. I'll answer it, and... Uh, We'll have a good time with that. Um, this is, uh, the majority of this is a series that I've taught before, and it's important to me for a couple of reasons. Why? Because I later you get into that scenario and you're like dude what was that advice you understand that's what we're doing today all right so with that being said um i have a i had a clicker aha 
You know what's real awkward? When I put on a jacket in my closet at home and I pulled this out of it, that was awkward. <laughs> Becky's like, hey, do you know where that, uh, no? So what I want to look at today is, is a godly relationship. And today is going to focus on the types of relationships that typically exist within the Romanian American church and not just within the Romanian American church, but also outside of the Romanian American church, but definitely within the Romanian American church. So I like graphs because I'm a nerd, all right? But graphs explain things, so it's good. So I'm going to describe a little bit of the graph to you as we kind of go through this, and then I'm going to, we're going to walk through, through four different types of relationships uh, that exist. So that's our graph. Time is on the bottom. Closeness is on top, I mean, on the side. So as time progresses, you get closer and closer to a person in a relationship, okay? Uh, the, the starting point, our zero point on the graph is when some guy asks you out or, you know, this is 21st century, I guess some girl could have asked you out, whatever. <laughs> That's unbiblical. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> is it okay for a girl to pursue a guy? That's a fantastic question. I don't know. Ruth pursued Boaz. But anyway, so eh? begin courting starts right there. All right? So that's, that's what we're doing with our, with our graph. Uh, the next point in the graph is the wedding day. All right? So at some point in time, as time progresses, uh, you're growing in closeness, and then you start from the day that you start courting to the day that the wedding happens. As you grow in closeness, there is a dashed line that everything above that is reserved for marriage. And I want you to understand something. When I say what's above that line is reserved for marriage, the quickest thing that we think of is physical intimacy. Okay? Uh, things reserved for marriage is not just physical intimacy. All right? There are some things, some parts of your heart that, that you shouldn't give away on day one. You understand? You shouldn't be like, this is my soulmate. We're going to get married. You know, oh, wow. How long have you guys been together? It's about 46 minutes now. You know, that's, that's a bad idea. That is the wrong approach. And we'll talk about that because, boy, do I have some examples for you. None of them are in the room. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so so those, are, those are parts of your life that are reserved for marriage. Okay. So the first slide, it's the one that I'm going to explain how the graph functions. It's also the slide that uh, uh, is, is really the ideal slide, what we're shooting for. That's typically a year. That's just a rough number. That's just a, a semi-healthy number that I think is a great number to pursue. It doesn't mean you have to you know, be married in a year. My wife and I got married in 13 months. It's fine. Um, that's, that's what you're looking to pursue. You begin courting, you're growing at a gradual pace until you cross over the, the marriage line and the things reserved for marriage and you cross into it together all at once, all right? We're gonna come back to this. That's the last thing we're gonna talk about. The first thing we're gonna talk about is this. Um, actually, no, we're gonna go back because first I gotta talk to you guys about a couple of things. In James chapter one, verses two through four, it says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing or lacking nothing. Healthy relationships between people, any people, you and your parents, you and your best friend, you and your coworkers, you and your, your fellow uh, uh, churchgoers, healthy relationships between people come from healthy relationships as Christians between us and the Lord, okay? The healthier the relationship that I have with God, the healthier the relationships around me are, all right? Marriage, marriage was not designed, it wasn't an accident, it was designed, it was not designed to be something that exists outside of a relationship with the Lord, all right? Can marriages succeed for people who aren't Christian? Of course they can but they weren't designed for that, all right? There's a big difference between the two. So what I want to get at, though, is this. Is healthy relationships between people, healthy relationships between husbands and wives come from healthy relationships with the Lord. The closer that I have a relationship with the Lord, the much healthier of a relationship that I have between me and my wife. And, I mean, we could talk about that for hours and hours, but there's only so much uh, time tonight, and I want to touch on everything and not keep you guys here till forever. Um, if you look at that verse in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it says, So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Perfect and complete. Who wants to marry the perfect spouse? Everybody, all right? All right, right? All right. We want to marry the perfect spouse. You want to marry somebody who's complete. Now, what I want you guys to understand is perfect for people does not mean perfect as in you will never make a mistake. That's not what perfection means, okay? Let me ask you a question. What's a perfect soldier? 
Is a perfect soldier one who's never gonna make a mistake? No, it's one who is perfectly prepared. It is one who's perfectly trained. It is one who is right for the task at hand. It is one who is complete in his training. He is a perfect soldier. He is ready to go. He's got great times. He's got great endurance. He's completely topped out in all of the different stats that he's gonna be topped out in, and he's a perfect soldier. And then you send out the soldier into task. Um, what's a perfect spouse? Is it somebody who's never gonna make a mistake? No, it's somebody who is perfect and complete in Christ and prepared. You see, uh, our, our execution of what we believe isn't going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes. But our commitment needs to be perfect. Does that make sense? It's the same thing in my relationship with my wife. It's the same thing between me and the Lord. I'm not going to execute perfectly everything that I believe in my relationship with Jesus. I'm going to make mistakes as I go. But my commitment is stellar. So sometimes I make bad decisions. What do I do? I repent. Why? Because I'm still committed. It's not like, oh man, I was, I was batting, you know, 100% after I got baptized, can't commit a sin because God knows that you can't be baptized a second time. So if you commit a sin now, you're going straight to hell, all right? I'm being sarcastic because some people think that, all right? Uh, so what happens is what? You make, you make a mistake and you're like, but all right, it's all over. I can never be forgiven again. So now I'm just back in the world. No, you repent, all right? So it's your commitment that has to be perfect. That's what it means to be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. When our endurance is perfected, when our patience is perfected, are we going to make mistakes? Of course, but we have to be committed to one another. Yeah. Complete there means mature in Christ, ready to overcome temptations and trials, not shaken by everyday situation, able to handle problems in a mature and in a godly way. Is that something that you think is needed in a relationship and in a marriage? Are there problems in a marriage? Of course there are. Is, is marriage work? Of course it is. Is being in a relationship work? Of course it is. Is being perfect and complete as in fully prepared for marriage something that we want? Absolutely. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. If you are unable to leave your mama and your daddy, then you're unable to be joined to a wife. If you are unable to leave your family, then you are unable to create a family. Does that make sense? And I don't just mean financially, even though that's a huge part of it. All right? You can't get married and you know, move in and live in the living room with your wife. All right? it, it doesn't function that way. When you get married, you are to separate, that's one action, and cleave, as, as it says in the NKJV, or be joined together, as it says in the NLT or the NIV. So, so there's a separation, and then there's a coming together. All right? So you can't come together if you're not ready to separate. And that just doesn't mean financially. That also means emotionally. That also means spiritually. That also means psychologically. To be able to be the kind of person that you can say, hey, you know what? I can, I can make a decision. I'm fully capable. I have all of this covering over me. And now I can separate from my mom and my dad and I can go and I can find a spouse. You know, when I decided to get married, I remember uh, it was uh, 2004 and I was hanging out with some friends in the Republic of Moldova. We were doing missions there. And uh, one, of my, one of my friends at the time, um, we just haven't spoken forever, still probably friends, uh, we're like Facebook friends, you know, like we haven't spoken in seven years, but anyway, we still follow each other. So anyway, uh, her name is um, Laura Repede. Actually, she's married. I don't know her last name is. Anyway, Laura Repede. And she asks me, she goes, hey, Eddie, um, so what are you going to do when you find the one? You know, what, what, what's, your, what's your game plan? Like, is it going to matter? Like, are you going to win over her parents? And, and I was like, no, it doesn't matter what her parents say. It doesn't matter what her mom says, what her dad says. It doesn't matter what the past, doesn't matter what she says. It's just, we're getting married and that's the end of it. All right. It's just, that's how it's going to be. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, years later, when um, Simida caught my eye, she caught my eye. She was right next to that plant praying for Claudia Oros at an altar call. That's when she caught my eye. We had been in the same church for years. I tried to hook her up with Mono Martis, the drummer, true story. And... <laughs> And, uh, and Mana's reply to me was, nah, man, she's more your style than mine. And I was like, no. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that happened. And uh, uh, we weren't ready, her or I, to separate from our parents. But when we finally got to a place to where we were ready to separate, then we pursued one another and then we started a relationship. And I remember we were in front of a, a, a burrito place that no longer exists. That's how you ask it a girl, by the way. You go take her to burritos. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I told her about courting and about pursuing a relationship together. And if she wanted to start praying about that together. And she said yes. And it was April. March, April, Yeah, April. I always forget which month that is. April uh, 12th. And May 12th, 13 months later, was our wedding day. So that's how that process went. But we weren't ready. Even though we knew each other, we were in the same church for years. We weren't ready to separate from our parents. But when we became ready, it went really easy, really easy. 
Yeah, if you're not mature enough to be an adult, then you're not mature enough to do adult things like have a family. All right, so now let's go through the different slides. So the first slide we looked at, uh, it's a picture of a perfect relationship, which is that. Um, they're progressing in closeness over time until the marriage date. Uh, the transition is seamless. Slide two is the same graph. It's a little different. Same time frame, but it grows way too fast, okay? The third one, I'm just gonna give you an overview real quick. The third one has two options to it, all right? One of them, one of them is the green card option. We'll talk all about that. And then the other one, that's a true story. Um, the other one is like, like, uh, like, a, like a puppy love kind of a thing. And then this is the five-year plan. The five-year plan is, nobody knows? Good. The five-year plan is the wrong plan, all right? Anyways, so slide two. Good time frame, but the growth is way too fast. What does this mean? This is a couple who follows every single impulse that they have. They are like a kid in a candy store. They eat any, everything with no regard, and they end up in pain with a pain in their stomach. It's called their partner. Uh, we need to be wise and mature and not act on impulses, but to make a plan. Relationships get out of hand and grow fast in closeness when we allow ourselves to be controlled by impulses, when we're not watchful. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. That's in the NLT. and the NKJV, it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Be sober-minded and be vigilant, or watch for the enemy. We're going to talk about both of those. Sober-minded, what does it mean when somebody's sober? To be clear-minded, right? What does it mean when somebody's not sober? Like, what's an example of somebody who's not sober? They are... Drunk, perfect, okay? So when somebody's sober, it means that they are not under the influence of anything, whether it's drugs, alcohol, emotions, hormones, whatever, all right? They're not under the influence of anything. They're sober-minded, all right? That's what Paul's talking about here, to not be underneath the influence of anything. He says, be sober-minded, be vigilant. Emotions are great. They are. They're absolutely great. They're a good thing. We shouldn't be emotionless zombies. We should have emotion. We should do things with great emotion. But emotions in the wrong place are devastating. Devastating. You, you ever watch in movies like, uh, like um, there's some, you know, some girl and she's interested in some guy and then she meets up with her girlfriends? Guaranteed like 99 times out of 100, the girlfriends give the worst advice I've ever heard on earth. I mean, just the follow your heart. And I'm like, what does that even mean, follow your heart? That's literally the fastest way to get into a place where you're going to be full of regret. Follow your heart. You know what I mean? And you know what's funny? If you look in the movie, it's always in the first like 10, 15 minutes that it happens, right? Follow your heart. She follows her heart. What's, what's the thing that happens? There's got to be some sort of drama to make the movie, right? Follow her heart. And then she gets her heart broken. And then there's the movie part where everything gets repaired. That's not real life. It just ends the way that it ended. Like imagine watching every romantic comedy and like 45 minutes into an hour and a half, you just turn off the TV. That's reality, all right? <laughs> You're like, oh, this terrible thing happened. What are they gonna do? Oh, they went separate ways. Done, that's, that's the reality of it, all right? The whole entire, uh, oh, you know, and then Hitch in the movie, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about, that movie Hitch, right? You know, oh, and then he came back around as some romantic. No, that doesn't happen. People move on. I'm just being real with you. Um, when we let our emotions take control of us, that's how we end up full of regret, confusion, and hurt later on. Uh, and there's so many examples about, about not following your impulses, right? Um, you know, like, 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 uh, uh, like I was rolling through Taco Bell the other day, because that's, that's where youth leaders live, by the way. If you, if you put my blood underneath the microscope, there's going to be little chalupas floating around, all right? That's <laughs> Taco Bell and pizza is what we live off of. I went to the round table next to my house and I asked them, uh, how much money have I spent there if they could check and keep track? Last time we checked, I was at 16,400 and some odd dollars. All right, yeah, we eat pizza a ridiculous amount. There are pizza boxes in my garage that are empty currently because they're on their way to the trash. There's two empty pizza boxes in my dining room table and probably I'm gonna order pizza tomorrow. I'm just saying it just, it's part of my life. So anyway, that's how you get this great youth leader body, by the way. <laughs> you ever buy things in a rush? There's this, there's this website called BitRL. 
all right, that several of you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's this website that Steve Getabian told me about, and they're a liquidator who has an auction here in Sacramento. You ever buy things, right? <laughs> it's the best. Uh, you ever buy things uh, from an auction and you see the timer counting down? Like you're just like looking on eBay and you're like, oh, I wonder if there's any, and you're like, four minutes left. It's only $75. Oh man, what is it usually priced at? And you have this like, uh, I'm gonna just buy it. I'm gonna buy it. And then you get excited and then you buy it. And then by the time it arrives two weeks later, you've done all your research and realize you've like paid triple what it was worth. <laughs> You understand? I've never had that happen to me or anybody else I know. So somebody just hung their head in shame. That's great. I'm not talking about anyone specific, Felicia Ushbat. So what? <laughs> so uh, she lives with us, so I get to make fun of her. It's part of the deal. And um, so whenever you buy things in a rush, you usually ends up being regrets. When I used to work, uh, you ever go like in that, uh, like the bank line at like uh, Banana Republic or Gap or Old Navy, whenever you go to check out, you know, it's like that stupid long line and it's just surrounded by all of little, you know, five, $10 items. You know what that area is called in the store? It's called the impulse section. It's literally designed for you to buy things on impulse. That's the whole premise of that. If they put any of that stuff anywhere else in the store, you would never buy it. It's stuff that's not just brought into the store and decided, oh, this would be good impulse. It's literally created specifically to be there. If they had no impulse section, they wouldn't even buy and sell those products. All right, because impulses is how people get us to make quick decisions without rationale. Look, decisions are meant to be made with your rationale, not with your emotions, with your rationale. Whenever you make emotional decisions out of emotions, that's when you usually end up with regret. When you calculate something out and think about it deeply, that's when you make a wise decision. Hey, why did you decide to buy that car? Oh, you know, because I spent three weeks taking a look at all of the different prices and I looked at all these different points and you know why you did what you did. Hey man, why did you buy that car? Man, I really liked the color. Wow, there's gonna be regret. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Emotions, rationale for making decisions. Emotions are there for fulfilling the decisions you made. So, okay, I decided that, that uh, you know, I'm gonna buy this car, great, good. We're good, we're good, check in with your brain. Hey, we're good, we're good, okay, everything's good. You check off the list, great, great. Now I'm gonna enjoy it. I'm gonna drive it with all emotion. I'm not gonna be like, wow, look at this, it turns out. No, you're gonna drive it, you're gonna enjoy it, you're gonna have a great time. You fulfill with emotion. If you fulfill with rationale, your life is bo boring and dull, it's stale, okay? So everything is great in its place, all right? Let's move right along. Um, seeing an opportunity to do something romantic that would possibly cross a line between you and a girlfriend or boyfriend or somebody that you're courting or whatever you, uh, word you want to use, that's, that's going to be an impulse. That's going to be a desire on an impulse. This couple says, I would never cross a line in the relationship. You know, what's interesting is um, crossing a line, like when you first start a relationship, everybody has boundaries. Everybody, Christian, non-Christian, everybody in the world has boundaries. Right? Go to any girl who's 25 and be like, hey, would you uh, uh, marry an 80-year-old homeless man? Nope. Oh, boom. Boundary. See? There's a boundary. It's a clear boundary. You see what I'm saying? Uh, everybody has boundaries. Everybody has boundaries. Okay? You know how you get to cross your boundaries? One step at a time. That's how you cross your boundaries. Man, you know, I'm a good godly guy and I'm, and I'm courting this good godly girl and I love the Lord and, and, and we're committed to not, you know, crossing the boundary of being uh, physically intimate until we're married. We're not going to cross a whole bunch of boundaries. There's a long list of things. We're just not going to cross any of those things. We're going to reserve those things for marriage because that's biblical. Okay. Those things are like way over there. So unlikely that they're ever going to happen. They're like over by the door, okay? I would have to take one gigantic step to cross that kind of a boundary. I don't even know if she would be on the same page, Okay but I'm totally willing to take a little step and then 99 more. And you know, that last step, it's not any bigger than this first one. Okay, you didn't cross that step on your hundredth step, you crossed it on your first. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying that this is the same as that. What I'm saying is you started on this day crossing that step. It just took you a hundred times, but you started today to cross that step. Does that make sense? Okay, you know what? I'm to take such a big step is, is impossible in my relationship with the Lord. I would never do that, but I could totally take a little step. Now, if I'm one step away and I've already had practice for 99 other times, how easy is that one gonna be? This first step, as little as it is, that last step, the same measure, this one's much harder to take than that one because this one I have no practice in. 
This one, I don't know if she's going to reject me. But the 99th one, oh, I already know that 99 times she accepted. The 100th will be another easy step. You see what I'm saying? That's why scripture says, be sober-minded. Don't be underneath the influence of anything. Yeah, I'm just going to take one step, but I'm not going to keep track of it. You didn't fail on the 100th. We fail on the first. Be sober-minded. Secondly, watch for the enemy. Watch for the enemy. The enemy is so brilliant. The, 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 the serpent, the devil of old, the, the, the enemy, Satan, whoever, whatever name you want to refer to him as, right? Uh, uh, scripture references to him as the wise old serpent. He's incredibly wise, all right? And what's, what's great is I don't have to outsmart him because Jesus already conquered the grave and we're surrendered to the Lord, but he is a great manipulator. He is the master manipulator, all right? And here's the trick that I've seen him do more than anything else in this specific category to young people, is he won't tempt you to sin at all to cross a boundary until he gets you in the right position. He won't spring the trap until you're on top of the X. Until you're on top of the X, there's no talk of trap. There's no temptation of trap until you're on top of the X. Let me give you some examples because this might make more, more sense. You know, um, it's not a sin to hang out with your girlfriend or your boyfriend. It's not a sin to hang out. It's not a sin to be on the phone at one in the morning. Oh, it's 11, uh, 1259. If I stay with you on the phone, the second it hits 1 a.m., it's considered sin. No, there's no verse that says, thou shalt not talketh with thy girlfriendeth <laughs> at 1 a.m. -eth. All right, that's KJV. <laughs> there's no verse. Somebody might tell you that and it's from the book of opinions. It's not in scripture, all right? So, <laughs> so the, the reality is, is that it's, it's not a sin to stay up late. It's not smart. It's not smart. And see, that's what the enemy does, where he goes, it's not a sin. It's not a sin for the two of you to hang out by yourselves. And it's not a sin. You won't even be tempted to cross any boundaries. You'll feel so strong in your faith. Man, we're going to go and spend some time, just the two of us, so I can get to know her, so, you know, uh, I can get to know him or whatever, you know, if you're, if you're a lady getting to know a guy or a guy getting to know a lady. You know, we're just going to get to know each other, you know, because I'm going to have to marry her. So you have all these logical conclusions that are making sense, that are being totally underneath the influence of your emotions and hormones and so on. And you feel like, man, I just feel like I'm so strong in faith right now. Because the enemy won't talk at all about the trap till you're on the X. And then when you get into that position... Then the temptation comes. Look, it's not, it's not, it's not a sin. It's not, it's not, it's not a, a, a dumb thing to walk around, to walk around by myself. It's not a dumb thing. It's a dumb thing to walk around by myself in South Sac in an alleyway at three in the morning. That's stupid. Well, I'm just walking around by myself. Yeah, but you're an idiot. You're going to get mugged. You understand? You can quote me on that. You're an idiot. You're going to get mugged. Hashtag Eddie's friend Joe sermon. <laughs> 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 don't do that. Somebody's going to do that. Uh, I hate you, Adi. You're doing it right now. Stop it. <laughs> oh, man. The point being that the enemy will provide you with opportunities where he's going to spring the temptation. But the temptation won't come until you're in the right place. And it's something I have seen more than anything else, his tactic that he uses. And honestly, it's pretty brilliant, isn't it? You feel incredibly strong, like, man, I'm going to work this out. And then you get into the place, and then the temptation comes on. You, you know how else that happens? <sighs> You'll be hanging out with a, a boy that you're courting or a girl that you're courting, and you're at your parents' house, which is good because you want your parents to get to know one another. Uh, by the way, anybody who's in a relationship, if you think, like, man, I'm going to just be in a relationship, but I'm going to hide this from everybody, okay, you only hide what you're ashamed of, all right? Who buys a brand new car... That's worth $75,000, but keeps it at home and keeps it hidden. Nobody. Why? Because you're proud of it. Who gets, who gets a 4.0 and hides it? Nobody. Why? Because you're proud of it. You know what you hide? You hide that, that, you know, Chevy Pinto that you're driving around, that Dodge Avenger. I used to drive one of those, all right? You know, you hide that because you parked down the street. Uh, the youth leader that was a youth leader before me had a car that was a convertible, and it was so cool. But he always had to park somewhere far away because the doors didn't open. You had to get in over the door, all right? It's a true story. <laughs> So, anyway, so uh, you don't hide what you're proud of. You hide what you're ashamed of. So if your relationship with a guy or a girl is pursuing marriage and you're in a relationship for marriage and you're, you're not crossing boundaries, you're not in sin, why would you hide it? It's just something to think about. Um, yeah, so let's say you're, you're courting a guy or you're courting a girl and you guys are at your parents' house, which is great. Your parents are there and your parents, for whatever reason... They should have enough sense to not make this decision. Decide, you know what, we're going to go out for a bit. 
So we'll just leave the two of you alone at home, okay? Bad scenario for whatever reason. It probably will never happen, but if it does, just use, use this example. Um, and you think to yourself, we're already in the middle of a movie. I don't feel like crossing any boundaries. I'm sure she doesn't either. It's going to be totally fine, okay? Something that I have seen become extremely common in, in, in the generation younger than me. I'm 33, so in the age group younger than me. Something that I've seen become very, very, very common is this. <sighs> There's been a justification for neglect. There's a huge justification for neglect. People will say to me all the time, people that I mentor, people that are, that are younger than them and so on, they'll say, well, you know, I, I, I didn't know, so therefore I'm justified. And you know what? Uh, that doesn't work with a cop. That doesn't work with, you understand what I'm saying? Well, I, I, I don't know it was a sin. That's not how that functions. You understand? There's a justification for my neglect of knowing what's right and wrong. There's a justification for me neglecting the scenario that, hey, I'm here with a girl, and you know what? I'm just not going to do anything. You know what happens? I see this all the time where, where a young person will see something headed in a direction that's sin, but they're not doing anything to head it in that direction. It just kind of happened upon them. So they'll say, oh, I'm hands off, and if we end up there, we end up there. Listen, neglect is a sin, right? Scripture teaches us that he who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin, right? Neglect is a sin, if I neglect feeding my kids and they die, do I go to jail? Of course I do. Why? Because neglect is a sin. It's a crime. It's wrong. So if I see my life going in a direction and there's people around me that have made some poor decisions for me and I'm in a scenario where I'm like, oh, I'm going to cross some boundaries and I just go, well, I didn't do anything, so therefore I'm justified. Justification of neglect is not an excuse. It's still sin. All right? The other thing that I see happening all the time is a lack of Taking personal responsibility. And I can't emphasize this enough, okay? There's a couple of things that we're going to be talking about at the summit. And the summit this year is going to be amazing, by the way. July 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Ron Brown, the director of Teen Challenge over all of Orange County. He's that older black gentleman that came to Peniel like years ago. He's going to be our main speaker. And this year we're talking about identity. So we're going to have a bunch of seminars and teaching on what it means to be a man, a Christian man the God of the Bible, the Jesus of the Bible, not the hippie that, you know, gets portrayed a lot of times in Western society, but literally the Jesus of the Bible. And we're going to talk a lot, uh, uh, the lady's going to talk a lot about what it means to be a, a woman of grace, a girl of God, a biblical woman. That's going to be our focus this year. And I'm super excited about this because we really feel like the Lord led us in that direction. But anyway, a lack of taking personal responsibility. There are some things that I believe that it means to be a man. There are some things that I'm teaching my sons about what it means to be a man. Okay? When you shake somebody's hand, you look them in the eye. Little things. When you shake somebody's hand, it doesn't matter who it is, you stand. You don't shake from a seating position. These are just my things, okay? These are just my things. It's, it's a sign of respect. Um, and I mean, we could go on and on and on about, about this specific subject. But um, when it comes to, to taking personal responsibility, I feel that there are fewer things that define what it means to be a man than owning up to when you screwed up. I have young people that I mentor all the time. All right, I have, I have young men and young women that I invest in all the time. I've been investing in young people for 17 years, all right? Dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens in smaller and in larger capacity. And whenever somebody screws up, I don't really care if they drop the ball. It's not a big deal. Everybody makes mistakes. I watch to see how they handle it. That's what I'm watching for. I watch to see how do they respond. Oh, well, you know, I screwed up because this thing happened. If this thing didn't happen, then I wouldn't have screwed up. Okay, yeah, no, that's fine. And then we move on. And they have no idea that I was waiting to see if they owned it. Because that's what matters to me, and that's what matters to the Lord. Some of you guys, you guys can't get past some sin in your life because you haven't owned it yet and asked for forgiveness. You got to own it, man. You got to own it, and then you got to move on. I was having a great conversation with a good, 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 close friend of mine about a scenario that they went through. And they, and they were saying to me, you know what? I shouldn't feel bad. And I said to him, I said, look, man, I love you, but you need to feel bad right now because what you did was wrong. And after you're done feeling bad, you need to move on. But until you own it, it can't transform you. And God allows the difficult things to happen in our lives and our failures to happen in our lives so that way we can learn from them. But if you don't own them and take responsibility for them, then you're never going to learn from it. So guess who gets to repeat that lesson again over and over and over and over again? And when it comes to relationships, this is what we're talking about when we say watch for the enemy. Okay, you cross the boundary, you take personal responsibility, you learn from it, you ask for forgiveness, you repent, and then you move on. And that's kind of the process that we need to be going through. Sorry, I, I'm just harping on this a bit much. Um, 
The other thing that ends up happening is playing the victim. Uh, we won't own our own responsibilities. We neglect the situation that we fall into. We don't own it for what it is. And then we play the victim because woe is me, look what happened to me. And all of those things hold us back from growing. So if you're gonna cross a boundary or you did cross a boundary, own it. Don't say, well, you know, we didn't mean for it, so therefore it's okay. No, it was wrong. God, we're sorry, forgive us. Now we're gonna own it. Now we're gonna move past it. We're not gonna be a victim being held here underneath the sway of that wickedness forever. Make sense? Good. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, okay. So this one, you've got, oh no, I'm sorry. We're, we're right here. This is the one that we spend the most time on. The rest of them will be a lot shorter. Uh, so what happens if you're in a relationship, you weren't sober-minded, you weren't vigilant, you grew in a relationship way too fast, and now it's three months later, you're not ready to get married for at least another nine months, a year, year and a half, two years, but you're right at the cusp of things reserved for marriage. What do you do? Really, you have one of three options, and your options are uh, bad, less bad, and good. So that's good, all right? Uh, <laughs> so the, the first option, which is bad, is you just cross over into things reserved for marriage. You just, it's an option. It's a terrible option, but you just cross right over. Um, crossing over into things intended for marriage for the rest of your life, you'll look back on your courting years with regret. For the rest of your life, you'll look back on your courting years with regret. With regret. Why have that? Why not look back on them for, with joy? You'll go through shame. You'll go through stress. You'll go through guilt. Uh, it'll be a very difficult time. And until the wedding date, that's just how it'll be. You'll have a lack of, uh, of, of complete fulfillment on the wedding day because you feel like, man, you know, I wish we would have done it a little bit differently. And those are real things that happen. I know people that had a ton of regret on their wedding day. And it's like, hey, it happened. Own it, fine. But you got to move on. Enjoy your wedding day. Like, you just got to get past that. But the enemy, what, do we really think that the enemy is going to see an opportunity and be like, it's her wedding day. It's his wedding day. You know what? I'm going to give him a break. That doesn't happen at all. The enemy sees an opportunity, you better believe he takes it. I mean, realize this. We work all day, we get tired, we sleep for eight hours. The devil never sleeps. He never sleeps. Thank God I don't have to fight him because the Lord already overcame him. So that's the bad option. The less bad, but still bad, but the less bad, is you plateau. You come up to that and then you just kind of, you just kind of hover along right underneath the things reserved for marriage. You want to know why that's not the good option? I'll tell you why, all right? Um, you don't break up, but you're not growing anymore either. So your relationship doesn't grow anymore. You're just repeating the same things and wondering what the point is. When you get married finally, you'll have to jumpstart that relationship, but it will be hard. It's easier to just be comfortable. You ever hear how like uh, uh, sometimes like um, people will complain, typically ladies will complain that, uh, you know, after we got married, the marriage just kind of went flat. He wasn't pursuing me anymore. That happens, okay? Now imagine if that happened after a year of plateauing. There's no growth happening in your relationship. You're not going any further. You're, you're staying out of marriage territory. You're not pursuing each other more intimately, more deeply. You're not building a life together because you can't. So you just plateau for a while. And then you get married, and now you're going to jumpstart. It's going to be harder. It's not going to be easier. I'm just being realistic with you, all right? Uh, when you get married, finally, you'll have to jumpstart. Now, there is a point in the relationship where you don't really learn much about one another anymore. And look, as somebody who's been married for 11 years, look, there's a point in the relationship where you're not really, it's not about the excitement of learning new things about Samida. No. You know what we do? You know what marriage is about? It's about building a life together. We get to build a life together. That's what happens after I already know all of her stories. I can finish her sentences. She knows my stories. I'm not learning new things about her. All right? What's new with us every day is the life that we build together. I'm not building a life and she's at home with the kids. No, we're building a life together. We make decisions together. We plan for our kids together. We plan for missions together. We, we plan for family vacations together. We make all sorts of plans and we execute them. We invite people over because we've been praying about them for a while and we feel like the Lord is saying, okay, now you can finally invite them over. We invite them over and we talk to them because we care about people. And it's this great journey we get to have together. But it's the life that you build after that. What life can you build as two single people? Right? You're going to hit a plateau. Oh, hey, you know what? Um, uh, I'm thinking of buying a new car. That's cool. Our money's separate. Do what you want. Right? Oh, hey, you know, I was thinking about, uh, uh, you know, um, buying an apartment. That's cool. I can't come over. Right? I mean, what are you going to do? You hit a ceiling. So that's why it's the less bad option. If you're not married, you can't build a life together, so you stagnate. And then the good, the good has two subversions, I know. All right, so version one, uh, you've come to a place where you can't grow anymore and you realize that marriage is still four, five, six years off. 
Sometimes I have like people that are 14 and they're like, Eddie, I found my soulmate. And I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> Terrible, but awesome. <laughs> um, somebody said I have a dark sense of humor. I don't even understand what that means. So you've come to the place where you can't grow anymore and you realize that marriage is still a few years off. Uh, option number one, you can go on the back burner. All right? Which means you wait for one another. It means that you're engaged to be engaged. You understand? You can get a promise ring and that's fine which goes on this hand, by the way, not that it matters, but anyway. Uh, you get a promise ring, and you can wait for one another. That's totally fine. And what that means is this, is that means that, hey, we're going to be good friends, but I'm not going to pursue, I'm not going to call you my girlfriend. You're not going to call me your boyfriend. We're not going to pursue a relationship together. We're not going to spend time alone together. We're not going to cross all of those boundaries. We're just good friends, but we're just waiting for one another. We're waiting until we get close enough to marriage that, that I can ask you out, and then we can begin this process of growing in life together. So when we cross that X at the top, that plus, the one year to things reserved for marriage, we just cross right on through into it. All right? That's what I mean by the back burner. That's what I mean about engaged to be engaged. You work on yourselves in that time. You become stable. You, you work on yourself so that way you're ready to leave your mom and your dad so you can cleave unto a spouse. And then when you're ready to try again because it's marriage time, then you begin the relationship again and you get married. If you're married in six months, that's great. If you're married in nine months, that's fine. It's great. Version number two, you're getting close uh, to the line and you're gonna be ready for marriage in less than a year. Slow it down, set up some boundaries, and plan your, plan your wedding date. All right? I, I've had countless people come to me. And they say, Eddie, you know, um, I don't finish college for another four years, but we're ready to get married next year. Like, if we had the money, we'd get married next year. But we're thinking we should wait several years. What I always advise them is the same thing. I always say, hey, look, uh, you should get married. You should get married. Is it going to be harder? Yes. But that's going to forge you guys together in marriage. That's going to build you guys together in marriage. Look, you can go to school for the next one year and then three, by yourself, and then the next three years still by yourself. It'll be hard while you're also trying to fend off your emotions from crossing boundaries with that other person. Or you can go to school by yourself for one year while you plan your wedding date, and then for three years while you're going through school, you're there through the honeymoon phase, which is some of the best times of marriage, and you're there with your partner and your spouse going through that. How are you going to make ends meet? You get a job. You get a job working at Walgreens, you understand? You don't live in the nicest area. You're not going to buy a 6,000 square foot house. It's fine. God provides. Plus, there's a huge community of Romanians around you that are here to help one another move forward and progress. All right? So, slide number three. Is this it? Yeah, slide number three. Healthy growth, but bad time frame. So, the only thing that's really changed here is the two yellow lines, but also, you see where it says wedding? It says three months above that. Three months. Not a year, three months. So, follow me along with this. Typically... You have two options. Typically, someone who's just looking to get married. That's option number one. You see that bottom line? Okay, this is what every girl uh, is terrified of and hopes never happens. All right? Uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. This is like, oh, you know, some guy asked me out, and, you know, you guys are talking, and you guys are in a relationship, and then three months goes by, and you're like, cool, you know, maybe like in like three months or you know, in a month or so, you know, maybe I'll meet his parents, and he's like, hey, will you marry me? And you're like, whoa, way too soon, all right? That does happen. And girls don't typically say yes. Listen to me. If you're 21, if you're 21 and you got your life kind of put together and, you, and, and, and all of that's kind of working out for you and you think you're kind of a catch, all right? I'm just, we'll say that too because uh, everybody thinks they're a catch to somebody, which is good, all right? So you think you're kind of a catch. If you're 21, this isn't going to really be an option for you, all right? But if you're a lady and you're 33, this might be an issue. I had a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, somebody who I love dearly, 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 dearly. Um, came to me and said, hey, uh, this guy asked me to marry him, and we've been just kind of talking on and off, and he's from a completely different country, um, and he asked me to marry him, and I said, oh, wow, it was great, man. How, how long have you guys been talking? It was about three months, and he wants me to sign a prenup. And I told her, I said, run, girl, run. Somebody's looking for a citizenship, and he found you. This is why I read Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Listen, you, I'm just going to say this for fellas and for ladies, you are better off single than in a bad marriage. You are better off single than in a bad marriage. And if you have to wait till you're in your 40s to get married, then wait till you're in your 40s. Because if you get married in your 20s, because, you know, I don't want to spend the next 20 years by myself or the next 10 years by myself until I find somebody and I marry them. I don't want to be that late in life. 
So you're going to marry somebody 10 years earlier and you're going to settle. And then you're going to have 50 years of miserable life. You got to weigh out your options. So please don't make that mistake. All right? You got to know what you're worth and you have to understand that you only have one life to live. Let's say we all die and we all go to heaven. We will never live life on earth again. We'll be in heaven. It'll be much better. But we'll never live life on earth again. So the life that you live is precious. Value it. Value yourself and make good decisions. Okay, option number two, which is the other leg there. This is unhealthy growth at an unhealthy time frame. So the first one, that's, that's the green card option, all right? Number two, this is like the 14-year-olds that are like, I found my soulmate, all right? Um, option number two is unhealthy growth at an unhealthy rate. These are people who grow super quick and are just looking to get married. If you've only known a person for like three months and you want to marry them, it's done on impulse, and impulse never lasts, all right? I bought a chocolate cake last week, no exaggeration. It was from Costco. It was like this big, and I was so happy and proud of myself, and we went home, and we ate the entire thing, and I thought, I mean, sorry, we didn't eat the entire thing. We ate like a, a third of it, and I thought to myself, surely I'm going to eat half of this thing, all right? I'm into fitness, fitness whole cake in my mouth, all right? And that's, that's what I was into, all right? <laughs> so... <laughs> So we're, 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 after a slice, it was so rich, I was done, okay? Can you imagine somebody who's in a relationship based on impulse? What happens when the impulse is gone? Oh, well, this is what we're left with. You know, like they say in the military, whenever people actually go out to Iraq, they're always greeted with the same phrase, hey, welcome to the suck, you know, because it just sucks out there. That's kind of what that's like. I've been watching a lot of military videos lately. Anyway, um, so... Yeah, people who grow super quick uh, and are just looking to get married is option number two. If you're like in the throes of um, an infatuation, you're making decisions out of emotion and not out of logic. And what might be wise is to say, hey, you know what? Everything's just getting way crazy, way too fast. I need a break for like two, three weeks so I can reassess and come back at this clean and not be underneath the influence. I need to sober my mind up. I need some time away, all right? Next slide. This is the worst idea on earth. The five-year plan is the wrong plan, all right? Um, I don't like the five-year plan. I am not a fan of the five-year plan. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, it says, but if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It's better to marry than to burn with passion or to burn with lust, as it says in this translation. If you are not able to marry yet, then don't put yourself in a place where it'll burn with passion. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 7, uh, Solomon says to his beloved, he says, not yet, do not awaken or arouse love before it pleases, meaning there's a time when love needs to be awoken and aroused and you need to have that kind of relationship, but that's when it pleases, meaning inside the confines of marriage, outside of the confines of marriage, you have to guard yourself and say, not yet, wait, do not awaken or arouse love until it's in a pleasing environment, until it's in the right place, which is the confines of marriage. So don't date until the time is right. When's the time right? When you'll be ready roughly within a year uh, from being able to have a marriage date is what I recommend. If you're on the five-year plan, let me tell you, the, the amount that you're gonna have to slow down your relationship to hit that cross is so slow, you're practically not gonna have a relationship right? It's just not going to be, and not that it's not going to be possible, it's going to be extremely difficult. Um, if this is you, if you're in a relationship and you're not ready to get married for several years, my honest to God, God-given uh, 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 authority to give you advice is this. You should break up, all right? I love you enough to tell you. And I know you're like, but I'm going to marry this girl. That's cool, all right? If you love her enough, just set her free, and if it's meant to be, it'll all come back together, all right? And that's just it. You just need to break up and walk away and focus on growing yourself spiritually, I'm just being real with you, all right? Um, did I already switch the page? Ah, yeah, no, I'm good. I got it. I got it. Sometimes that happens. Yeah, slide one is the healthy relationship. Now, I could talk to you about this for days. Uh, I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm actually gonna go to slide one, and then we'll finish up. There are very few, and I mean less than fingers I have in my hand, people that I know that I've been in a five-year relationship, doesn't matter if it's long distance, that have made it to marriage, not crossing any of the boundaries that they originally set up. I can think of possibly two, possibly. And one only because I don't know that well. But that's it. You're gonna end up crossing boundaries that you regret if you're in a five-year long relationship, all right? I'm just being real with you. Rarely have I seen it be different. I'll talk to you guys about that in a minute. So, right timing. When you're ready or close to being ready for marriage, this is, this is the right direction, all right? The right process. The right process is investing in relationship. Have you guys ever heard of this phrase that if you feed it, 
it will grow. You see the front row nose? Because I've ingrained it into their skulls. You understand? All right? It comes out of Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, where Scripture teaches us, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows that, he will also reap. Right? Which, and he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life, and he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. So what does that mean? It means if you're planting tomatoes, corn's not going to grow. It's that simple. All right? It's real easy. It's not a complicated concept. If you're investing in a healthy relationship, a healthy relationship is going to grow. What are some things that you can do to invest in a healthy relationship? I have some ideas here. All right. Um, so don't feed the wrong things like impulses, but feed the right things like godliness. Some great examples of what I would love to recommend to you guys, things that my wife and I pioneered and, and experienced in our relationship, things that all of our disciples we encouraged to do and in some capacity they did and created their own versions of it and things that I want to encourage you guys to do further is if you're in a relationship, you're pursuing marriage, it's not that far off, you need to invest in some godly things, all right? Some pre-choice choices. Some non-negotiables. That way when you're there in the moment and you're under the influence, you just reach back and you already have made your decision. We're not going to cross this boundary. We're not going to do these things. All right? So some of the things that, some investments that you can make is number one, pray together. You should pray together. You're Christians, right? Honestly. If you and your, your homie, if you guys are like really into basketball, when you guys get together, is it weird that you guys play basketball? No. It's normal that you play basketball. If you're into video games and your best friend comes over and he's into video games, is it weird that you play video games together? No, it's not. You understand? If you're at the shopping and your, your girlfriends meet you out somewhere and you guys go shopping, is that weird? No. In fact, it's perfectly normal. If you're Christians and you get together, why is it weird to pray? We're Christians. I'm a Christian. I like prayer. I like Jesus. You're a Christian. You like prayer. You like Jesus. So when we get together, why does it take a youth leader to say, all right, guys, let's pray? No, just pray. You can pray together. When you're together with your future spouse, hey, why don't we pray together? That's a fantastic idea. All right? You don't have to be together. You could pray over the phone. It's a fantastic idea. Uh, number two, most of you are in Timothy and Esther Project discipleship. Most of you are. So every week we have a chapter that we read and questions that we answer. Meet up at a coffee shop and do your reading together. I've done that for years with different young people. All right? You could do it with your best friend. You could do it with your brothers. You could get together in a small group of the guys that are in your group, guys that are not even in your group because we're all in the same chapter, same place, right? You get together with other guys from different groups. If you're courting a girl or a guy, you can get together with them. You can read the Bible together. You could talk about these questions. That's a fantastic way of getting to know people on a deeper level. Fast together. My wife and I, when we started courting, we picked Tuesday. Tuesday was our fast day, and we fasted together every single Tuesday for our relationship for God to lead us, guide us, and to speak to us. It was a great idea. We still fast together every Thursday now. Um, hold each other accountable to their commitments, church attendance. Hey, you know, I really want to just get better in my church attendance. Hey, I'll hold you accountable to that. So whenever they're missing, you look for them and you go, hey, I noticed that you're not at church today. You understand what I'm saying? These are just, just some general ideas. These are just some ideas. There's other people that have come up with much better ideas. I'm just giving you some of mine. Uh, here's a non-negotiable. Never be alone in private places. That is my favorite decision that I ever set up with my wife when we were courting. Never be alone in private places. That includes being in a car together by yourselves. That includes uh, uh, going out to um, uh, a picnic somewhere in the forest in a secluded area by yourselves. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I mean, these are just silly, but you just make a rule. I'm never going to be alone in a private place with this girl. All right. Oh, well, how are we ever going to get to know each other on a deeper level? Go to Olive Garden. You can sit at a table together. It's not the end of the world. You understand? You just get to know each other. What are you guys going to talk about that other people can't hear? You understand? Or that other people need to really focus in? The NSA is listening to all of us anyway, so. You know what I wonder? I wonder if I get a new phone or a new number, do I get a new NSA guy or is it still the same NSA guy? <laughs> These are the things I think about. <laughs> all right, so uh, second, you can meet with your mentors and gain insight and advice. All of you guys that are in Timothy and Esther Project, you guys have mentors of your groups, group leaders. You guys can meet with them, have conversations. Uh, read, read different books on relationships, how men and women work together, etc. Stay away from books on marriage because you want to be vigilant. It's going to talk about like intimacy and stuff. You don't want to do that, all right? But be vigilant about reading books about courting and dating. You guys can ask me or Adi or any of us for book recommendations, and then secondly, is you set right boundaries. You make pre-choice choices, right? Here's, here's just uh, six pre-choice choices that uh, we've all used in the past. Many of us have. Number one, don't talk or text after 11 p.m. You're not together in private places, but you kind of are. You have Snapchat. You just, uh, hey, you know what? I'm just, I'm just not going to snap you after 10 p.m. All right? Because literally Snapchat is 
instant media with no accountability. That's what that is. So just keep an eye out for that, all right? Another one is don't hang out, just the two of you. Uh, yeah, just you two after 10 p.m. in public places, but just don't hang out after 10 p.m. Why? Because everybody goes home, goes to bed, and then you find yourself in a private place. That's that neglect thing we were talking about. Three, uh, see each other no more than three or four times a week. Look, if you're trying to grow at a steady rate and you see each other and you text and you talk every single day, uh, what kind of trajectory do you plan for you and your future spouse? It's like we talk every single day. We finish each other's sandwiches. Good. We, uh, <laughs> so proud of you. Um, we're always, we're always together 24-7, but you're expecting not to grow at a super fast rate? You're going you're to plan, right? Uh, five, <laughs> this is, this is I, I, I mean, this is like, even like the way that it's phrased is, I think, really biblical. It's like got like spiritual connotation to it. Don't touch each other, all right? Just don't touch each other. It's not complicated, you know? It's, she got something on her face, get a stick, you know? <laughs> it's, <laughs> then she'll have a permanent something on her. No, that's wrong. Um, <laughs> just, just don't touch each other, all right? Look, you make that commitment, and it'll help you a ton, all right? Lastly, uh, define when holding hands and when a first kiss should be. My wife and I decided that we wouldn't kiss until our wedding day, and then at some point in time, something happened. We were like a month and a half before our wedding day, and she was excited about something, so we turned around, and then she kissed me, and she crossed the boundary. I didn't. Anyways... <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Danny hit the nail on the head. And then I told the Lord, God, this woman you gave me. <laughs> that was Danny's. Good job. <laughs> so define when those boundaries are. So that way she can feel secure in the relationship moving forward. Okay. And that way you can feel successful in keeping to that. We're going to talk about success and security next, uh, not next week, but in two weeks from now, all right? So I think that we're really moving and tracking in the right direction. Let me have you guys stand, and I want to talk to you about two more things, which are right here. This is a fantastic series for men only and for women only. I talked to Alina Samoshi. They have it in the bookstore currently. Um, this is a great book for whenever you're getting closer to marriage. Like, if you're engaged, psh, grab these, all right? They're, they're small books. They're not very big. They're not very thick, and I would recommend this. Ladies, read for men only, and gentlemen, read for women only. Read each other's book first. So if it says for men only, that's for the ladies, okay? Here's why. Because it explains from a woman's perspective the way that women function to men. And what's good is you can read it, one, to gain an understanding about yourself, ladies, uh, and then you could highlight which parts really pertain to you. And then you switch books, because he'll do the same thing with his. And then as you're reading through it, you're not just reading through a book that talks to you about the other, the opposite sex and the way that their psyche and their mind works, but it's talking to you about your specific spouse to be. It's talking to you about them because you'll see which parts are highlighted and really important to this guy that you're going to marry, this girl that you're going to marry. That's a brilliant idea. And then the other book, I just really wanted to recommend it. It's in the bookstore as well. It's called The Journey of Desire. This isn't about desire between a man and a woman. It's just about desire that we have in our hearts. And specifically to men, John Eldridge writes great books to men. If you ever read... Uh, Wild at Heart, thank you. The same author, all right? This is a brilliant book, all right? So if, if, if you want to talk about like that desire that you have to live life to the full, that's, that's a great book. I just wanted to make you those recommendations. But with that being said, um, let's close in a word of prayer, yeah? Let me have you guys bow your heads and close your eyes. Father God, we just come before you, and Lord, we're excited to have healthy relationships. God, we want to have healthy relationships. God, we want to have healthy marriages. We want to have healthy parenting. We want to have healthy grandparenting. We want to have a healthy community. And so, God, we don't just desire those things. We seek out and pursue how to have those things and then to execute in having those things. And I'm so glad, oh Lord, God, that you're faithful, that you're good, that you're leading us. I pray, oh Lord, for any young people here that are in a relationship and they're full of guilt or regret. I pray, God, that, God, you would... Help them, O oh Lord, own that, and that you would heal them of that. And they would help them, O oh Lord God, pursue purity, pursue godliness. I pray, O oh Lord God, for all of the young people, Lord, that are here that will or are thinking about pursuing a relationship. God, if they're not there yet, God, take away those feelings. God, if they're in a place, God, where those feelings should be there, help them, O oh Lord, to pursue them in a godly way. And I also pray, O oh Lord, lastly, for anybody who really feels like they need to talk to somebody, that God, you would give them the courage to talk. And I just surrender that to you, O oh Lord. And we pray all of this in your name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Uh, I won't see you next week, but I'll see you guys in two weeks for sure.